and obedience. And then the fourth thing is this. The single most uh, validating reality in life for your faith is not some idea in your head, it's trials. It's what can your faith survive? You know, people who say, well, I believe in the Lord, and something goes wrong in their life, and they walk out. Well, that's not a saving faith. That's not a faith that's a gift from God. What do you do with John the Baptist then? John the Baptist questioned his ministry when he was in jail. Are we to say that he didn't have saving faith until after that moment? Come on. Like, I don't, I don't believe that. I don't believe that to be true. What do we say about Peter who the devil sifted like wheat, you know? What do we say about him? None of these things point to Jesus. They all point to yourself. Welcome back to Bible Line. I'm your host, Pastor Jesse Martinez. And today, yes, we are doing another Pastor Reacts video. This one is to a video from Dial In Ministries, about 60,000 subscribers and this video that we're going to watch today has just about 777,000 views two years ago. And Dial In, uh, which is led by this guy named Johnny, he has had John MacArthur on his show. He's interviewed Paul Washer and some other prominent Calvinists. And John MacArthur, this video was sent to me because John MacArthur addresses in about 17 and a half minutes, he addresses, how do I know if I'm really saved? The person who sent this to me uh, said that they've been struggling with their salvation because they come across content like this. And I just want to say from the outset, I have no agenda against MacArthur as an individual, but I will also tell you that he is the leading guy right now in the Lordship Salvation Reform Doctrine camp. It's videos like this that cause people to descend into madness because instead of looking to the finished work of Jesus Christ and recognizing that God is the one that is justified because he has recognized the sacrifice of Christ, they look back to themselves. And they, you know, people like MacArthur also, they, they deny this idea that a real Christian is going to stay in carnality. There is, there is a carnal Christian, and we're going to go through that with some of the examples that I bring up to you. I encourage you to check this video out for yourself and to test the responses that I give you. But I also want you to know, if you're here today and you're coming on here to try and have security and peace um, about your salvation, you can have that right now. You simply look to Jesus Christ. Salvation has nothing to do with what you can do because there's nothing that you can do to pay for your sins. And what Jesus Christ did on the cross has been accepted by God. So the offer is there, whosoever believeth. And if you're here and you understand that you're a sinner, which we all are, and that you can't save yourself by any good deeds, turning from sin, promising something or starting something, then all you need to do at that point is put your faith in Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God who shed his blood to pay for your sin. He was buried and he rose again three days later. And if you put your trust in him, God says, not MacArthur, not Martinez, not others, God says you've been passed from death unto life, and you are now adopted into the family, and you are eternally secured. Your salvation is completed. It's finished. Everything from this point forward is about spiritual maturity. It's about blessings. It's about rewards. It has nothing to do with proving that you're really saved. Let's dive in. Pastor John, my question for you is, how can someone, how can I have assurance of my salvation? I think it's so important because so much of our growth in Christ biblically is rooted in a confidence that we have been saved. And for me so that's a very good point. The spiritual maturity, the spiritual instruction that we have is all because we have been redeemed. But you're going to come to find here that the redemption aspect of them uh, oh, excuse me, the redemption aspect of their view is based off of your performance. It's not based off of Christ. Christ is the starting point. That's what they're going to say. But then as they go forward, it's going to be like, well, you're going to have this and this and this and this. And that's how you know if your faith was really saving faith. And for many people, they don't know if they've actually been saved. They think they have, but they don't remember a specific date or then there was a season of sin. 
And so it's hard for them to move. So I just want to address that momentarily. You don't have to. There, there's no biblical support for the idea that you have to remember the day that you trusted Christ. I had a friend of mine who put it in a good way. He's not looking to a day that he believed as the proof of his salvation. He's looking to the empty cross and the empty tomb. That is the proof of his salvation. Jesus Christ has been accepted by God. He is who he claimed to be, and that payment for sin has been accepted. I grew up in a church where that was kind of something that was talked about, this date. You know, if you don't remember the date that you were converted, how can you really say you're converted? That's all man's reasoning that doesn't line up with Scripture. You know, the nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Uh, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And then later on in that same passage, it says, if, if, if we believe not, the Lord is faithful and he, he abideth still. So it doesn't matter with it does it it doesn't matter how much you remember as far as the day of your conversion but if you believed there's a transaction that happened and that's maintained by God he's the one that keeps that record. And then the other people the other thing that he said here is uh well you have your uh, you know you have your season of sin that's a very good calvinistic phrase a season of sin because they believe if you're really saved it'll be a season it won't be a whole lifetime of sin. But they say, oh, well, because of this season of sin, I don't know if I'm really saved. Both of those point back to something you did, point back to something that you're currently doing. Christ is not in that message. We're 30 seconds in. We've talked about salvation. And the question has been asked. Let's see what MacArthur says. Forward uh, with confidence that they have been saved and therefore they are dead to sin. So help us out. How can we have assurance that we are saved? Well, you can eliminate one thing for certain that can take your assurance, and that is the idea that you could lose your salvation. Hmm. That, that's a lie. Salvation is forever. Yep. Salvation is eternal. There's nothing that can separate you from the love of Christ. Jesus said in John 6, all that the Father gives to me will come to me, and I will lose none of them but raise them at the last day. Salvation is forever. So if you are saved, it's forever that faith cannot fail because that faith is not your faith. That's a gift of God who's given it to you, Ephesians 2. So stop there for just a moment. Nothing as far as Calvinistic words were said, but there are principles that are baked into his response. First of all, what he says is correct. Salvation is forever. And this is why I think teachers like MacArthur are dangerous because they'll say things but they mean something different. He believes salvation is forever because, as he just said there, it's not your faith, it's the faith that God has given to you. That is the you of TULIP, the unconditional election. God is eternally decreed that all of those who are created to eternal life, he will make them believe. Now, their confessions don't say make them believe, but if God is sovereign and his decrees cannot fail, then guess what? It, he has to be able to bring to pass eternal life for those he's created for that purpose. So when MacArthur says salvation is free, or excuse me, um, uh, salvation is eternal, you have eternal security, and you can't lose it, he's saying it because, well, God has picked you, and what God has picked will come to pass. That's exactly what he said at the end there. And he quotes, if he, well, he references Ephesians 2. And if you're familiar with Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. There's a lot of debate with the Calvinist as to what it is means. Is that the faith, or is that salvation? A basic study is, it is, salvation is, the gift of God. Verse 9, not of works lest any man should boast. The Calvinist interprets that by saying, it is, that refers to faith. So you coming to faith in Christ has actually nothing to do with your own volition, your own recognition of the truth, and then a changing of mind. It has everything to do with God is just making you do what he's already predetermined you to do. That's Calvinism. So you see why this is dangerous? Because some people in the comments are going to go, well, MacArthur's good. He's, he's got good stuff. Yeah, I understand. He teaches some things correctly and all that. But this right here, it makes everything else a no-go. It makes everything else a no-go. Now, everything that he's going to say after that statement about you can't lose your salvation, it's God's faith, it's not your faith, he slipped that in there. Now he's going to go to the test. Now, when a person hears this, automatically the first thing that comes to mind, I would assume, is, well, how do I know it's God's faith and not my own deceptive faith? 
how do I know I'm not believing something that God is actually not wanting me to believe and my belief is in rebellion to his plan for me? What a mess. But here's the test. So you eliminate that if you get your theology right that salvation is forever. So all you want to know is, is my salvation forever? And here's how you know. I think there are three tests and then a fourth comment. Test number one is, what do you love? What do you love? If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away, new things come. So that's the first test. What do you love? You want to know if you're saved? You need to look at what you love. Jesus is out of that message. And this is also where I would say a lot of Calvinists, I haven't, I have not proven this, but I would assume based on that statement, a lot of Calvinists reject the idea of the duality within the believer, an old sinful nature and a new nature. I, I, I know that it's proven in scripture. Galatians chapter five talks about it. Romans chapter six and chapter seven discuss it in great detail. But for MacArthur, it seems like if you're saved, that's going to be proven by what you love. Your desires are going to change. I want to read to you 1 Corinthians chapter 3. A letter that is written to the Corinthian church, which is described in chapter 1 as sanctified and in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 3, Paul begins by saying, And I, brethren, verse 1, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I, Paul, have fed you, Corinthian believers, with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye believers were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye believers able, for ye are yet carnal. I don't think it would be a stretch to say that they didn't love the things that they were supposed to love. Is that a proof that Paul is talking to an audience of believers who are believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, or they have already believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, but now because he has to talk to them as carnal that they were never really saved? That never comes up once in his discussion here. Not once. For whereas there is among you envying, strife, divisions, all sinful things, are ye not carnal and walk as men? And then he goes through in verses 4 through uh, uh, 6 about people having this uh, clicky thing. Like, oh, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, all that kind of stuff. God says we're laborers together in verse 9. According to the grace of God, verse 10, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. There's this principle here that the foundation is already secured. Verse 11, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. We build off of him. MacArthur says you build off your desires. What do you love? Let's let him continue. What, what are these new things? I, I like to think of them as new affections. So the first mark of a believer, it's not perfect love, but it's evident love. What, what do you What's the difference between perfect love and evident love? And I mean that honestly. I'm not trying to be difficult. But if it's a matter of heaven and hell, you got to define that. This is all frilly junk. It, you, you can't prove any of it. And why is it not, you know, what? why isn't it perfect love? Aren't we supposed to be perfect now since we're in Christ? According to their doctrine. People look at that and they don't understand the difference between perfect and evident. And if you want to just do a, a case analysis of it, evident means you got to show it to others. Who's that? Legalism. I'd like to come in. And now it's a big game. You know, all, all, all the outward things are going to be the focus. When the Bible says rest in Christ, <laughs> he's the one that uh, has justified. You love, you love the Lord. You, you love his word. You know, you don't love him like you should. It needs to be increased. You don't love the word like you should, but you love those things. You love the people of God. You want to be. That made no sense. It didn't make any sense. How do you evidence your love for God and your love for the word when you don't necessarily love those things, but you should love them. That, that, that is like standing in front of the mirror every single day and questioning if you are really born. I was born on a certain day and a certain time. Okay. I don't question that every day. I don't wake up and go, man, was, did that really happen in 1990? I don't know. I gotta go find out, you know, that, that would be a negative impact upon my life. You know, what example would I be setting for my church if I couldn't even 
stand in the pulpit and have assurance of my salvation. And if I did stand in the pulpit and my assurance was based on my performance, how in the world am I going to point people to Christ when I'm trying to work for my own salvation? Let's let him continue. Of the people of God, you want to be with his people, you want to be in the church, you want to be a part of a worshiping group. So love is the first evidence of a transformed heart. Second. Now, that statement on its own, love is the first evidence of a transformed heart, surely that could be true. Obviously, when you trust in Jesus Christ, you have a new nature. You have this expectation to have the fruit of the Spirit, which is a sign of maturity. You're abound more and more, and that could be shown in a, in a transformed heart. But that's not the question that he was asked. He's asked, how do I know if I'm really saved? Well, how, you know you're really saved if you have love. And it's not perfect love, but it's evident. And it's love for God, and it's love for God's word, but it's not a love like, if you don't love it, then you have to love it. And, okay. The second one is humility. There's humility. a sense in which you are aware of your sinfulness, and you never really get over this incredible grace that's been given to you to mm -hmm. save you. Humility is something that we are commanded to have in Scripture as a believer. Absolutely. We're supposed to stay humble. Let's take a look at that for a moment. Uh, Philippians chapter 2 is where I think there's probably the best example. Uh, verse 1, if there be any consolation in Christ, comfort of love, fellowship of the Spirit, bowels of mercy, fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, humility, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then it goes through all the things that Jesus did as a demonstration of humility. Then when you get down to verse 12, it says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now, which, uh, now much more in my absence, work out, not work for, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So there's an aspect to what he is saying that is correct, but it's incorrect in how it's being applied. Your humility, your Christ-likeness is how you demonstrate your salvation. It's how you demonstrate what you have believed. It's not how you prove that it happened. It's how you demonstrate it to other believers and to those that are lost. And the fact that it has to be instructed tells you that it's not natural for us to just automatically do these things. We have to learn how to do these things. Work out your salvation, your own salvation, with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. As you obey the Lord, which is the first thing that's said in verse 12, as ye have always obeyed, as you obey the Lord, he's going to work through you. This is not a proof uh, that you're really saved. The only proof that I see, that I search for to see if a person is really saved is what do they say about Jesus Christ? What do they say about him and specifically their sin debt? And I have met a lot of people who are more spiritual outwardly than me, but they are not born again because they're looking to their outward spirituality to get them to heaven. And they're denying that what Jesus Christ did is sufficient. Let's continue. The third one is obedience. It's not perfect obedience. But it's a longing in your heart to obey the Lord. So we've got love but not perfect love, humility but not perfect humility, obedience but not perfect obedience. Can I tell you what partial obedience is? It's disobedience. Go check out one of our spiritual health series where we talk about rebellion. That is the heart of King Saul. Well, I didn't destroy the Amalekites totally, so... And I, and I kept the best sacrifices for you, Lord. He was stripped of the kingdom that day. That's what, if it's not perfect, if perfect obedience is required, but not perfect obedience, you're saying it's okay to sin. It's okay to just continually live in sin. It's not a problem because, you know, you obey sometimes. Now, I bet you MacArthur would disagree with what I just said, but he said perfect, you know, obedience, but, you know, not perfect. It's like, then what is it? So that, that's the three. That's the three. You got love, humility, obedience. Look at yourself. Look at yourself. Look at yourself. Jesus stays out of this. Your salvation is dependent upon you. 
And it's like, how can anybody know that they're saved? Well, they won't. They won't know. You do acknowledge him as Lord and you want to obey. So love, humility. My daughter might want to obey. But if she doesn't obey, then she's disobedient. Hello. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And obedience. And then the fourth thing is this. The single most uh, validating reality in life for your faith. So I just want you to see, we talked about these three things, and we're about to introduce a fourth that he is saying is the single most important. Is not some idea in your head. It's trials. It's what can your faith survive? You know, people who say, well, I believe in the Lord, and something goes wrong in their life, and they walk out. Well, that's not a saving faith. That's not a faith that's a gift from God. That, see, that is so confusing. Because now we've, we've, we've just taken the love, humility, and obedience, and we have made it so insignificant to how you deal with tragedy and difficulty. I, I, don't, I don't even understand. What do you do with John the Baptist then? John the Baptist questioned his ministry when he was in jail. Are we to say that he didn't have saving faith until after that moment? Come on. Like, I don't, I don't believe that. I don't believe that to be true. What do we say about Peter, who the devil sifted like wheat, you know? What do we say about him? None of these things point to Jesus. They all point to yourself. Because that lasts. So you take Job as an illustration. Job, devastation. Okay. I mean, just devastation every way you could cut it. And he says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. So when you go through it. Job also questioned God's validity to give him this discipline. I want you to see that because I think that's important. Now, we're in no way going to go through a verse-by-verse -verse study of Job right now. But there's, there's some pretty, you know, Job is saying what he's saying. He's listening to his friends. He's, he's getting into his feelings. You know, he's feeling a certain way. And then God answers him in Job 38, 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsels by words without knowledge? I think I would melt into a puddle if God addressed me in such a way. Then he goes on, say, gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. And then he goes on and he lays down the wood and he asks Job's questions of which he needs an answer. Job chapter 40 and verse three. Then Job answered the Lord and said, behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. I love the visual example. I'm not going to say any more. Once have I spoken, but I will not answer. Yea, twice, but I will not. I will proceed no further. And the Lord answers him again in verse 6. Uh, in verse 7, Gird up thy loins now like a man. I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. And then he goes to, Wilt thou disannul my judgment? Wilt thou condemn me that thou mayest be righteous? So yes, Job went through a lot. I'm not going to deny that. But to act as though he had no question, he had no, you know, nothing was wrong. Obviously, God wanted to, God felt that it was appropriate to challenge him. I think it was because the advice he received from his friends was boo-boo, not good. And then I believe that Job started to think, maybe I am kind of beyond, you know, this isn't fair. I don't think he ever said that. But obviously, when God addressed it, it was from the position of, who are you to judge the way that I do things? But MacArthur says, look at your trials, and that's how you're going to really, that's where it is. That's where the, that's where it is. A trial, maybe your mom is, is, gets cancer, or maybe your dad dies, or maybe some horrible thing happens, or maybe you're invested in a relationship, and, you know, the, the person you're interested in walks away from you, or whatever the issue is, maybe you get an illness. Maybe you don't know if you're really saved, so you turn into something that gives you more peace and security than a twisted view of the Word of God. I think that might describe a lot of people that listen to this stuff, and they end up going, how can I ever know? And they just, I'm just going to live it up. Does your faith stay intact through that trial? That's what Peter's talking about when he says it's those kinds of trials that validate your faith. 
And so I have to say this in all honesty, if you're 15 years old, you might question your faith more than you do than you would if you were my age, because I've, I've been through that. I've been through a wife that broke her neck and so this is the classic, what's your source? Trust me, bro. That, that, that's exactly what he just said. And to the 15 year old that might be watching, you don't have to question your salvation. That's not healthy. That's not natural. That's not a part of your journey. You can rest assured in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now go and live in peace and in harmony and enjoy and go do the work of an evangelist. I think that's why I wanted to react to this video because of that comment right there. It is not a natural part of your process to question. One of my mentors, Dr. Arnold, Dr. Ralph Yankee Arnold, many of you are subscribed to him. He's in his 80s. He does not have a better a, a understanding of salvation than I do because he's older and he's been through difficulties. And that man has been through difficulties. He's lost his oldest son. His wife has had a heart attack and recovered from it. He's lost ministries. He's seen people come and go, all of it. He's been through hardship. But none of that has made him understand his assurance in Christ more. His assurance in Christ is already rested in Christ, and it helps him address all those issues. And he said, uh, you know, that's what he, uh, MacArthur said, I tried to pause the video, but it, it, was, it was escaping me. <laughs> but he goes through and he uses 1 Peter 1.7 as a defense for this. He says, 1 Peter 1.7 says that the trial of your faith, being much more precious and of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise, honor, and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. There's nothing here to validate if it's real. The question is, is your faith profitable? And specifically, that profitability of faith is at the judgment seat of Christ. Are you going to have a faith that demonstrates itself in works so that the Lord can reward you for it? That's what Peter is, is encouraging here. Don't give up. He's writing to scattered uh, uh, Christians that are in persecution. Don't give up. You're going to receive praise, honor, and glory for the things that you suffer. But it, it, in no way does, it, does the trial of your faith mean that it's trying to prove if it's genuine or not. And the Calvinist loves to throw that word genuine, authentic, all around. So we're going to take a break here and we'll, we'll continue this next week, but I, the reason why I, I'm splitting this into at least two parts is because I've reviewed this video and everything that he says I think needs to be discussed because there's almost, I mean, I don't want to say almost, but over, I, we're, this video is close to a million views. People are watching this. Get in the comment section on this video, not our video here, but on this video from Dial In Ministries, and you see people are hopeless, and the people that have hope are all looking to themselves and how they've overcome addictions and all that kind of stuff. So until next time, keep looking up. Jesus Christ is coming soon. Thank you. God bless. And I'll see you here next week. If you enjoyed today's episode of Bible Line, make sure to subscribe to the channel and share this video with a friend. Do you have a Bible question? Send us an email, questions at BibleLineMinistries.org, and we'll do our best to get you an answer. Or you can leave your question in the comments of this video. Be sure to check the links in the description for more clear Bible teaching. Bible Line is a ministry of Calvary Community Church located in Tampa, Florida.